From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What up, everybody? It's Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's, part of the Warchant.com family. If you're not a member of Warchant.com, what are you waiting for? Come on. Every single day we tell you. Warchant 30. It's a promo code. 30 free days of access to the Ultimate Seminole Sports Source. And if you're a student, email us from your Florida State student email address. Email support at warchant.com. You'll get a promo code. 12 months. Tell them how much it costs, Corey. It costs a dollar per month. What's, that's so, how it works out, too. But the, I don't like saying that because then it sounds like we're just going to charge you a dollar every month. But we're just going to hit you for 12 bucks up front. I thought that's what you asked me to do, what you asked me to say. Well, that's how much it costs. You're you're trying to you're marketing Sorry. it incorrectly. Correct. My fault. My fault. Apologies. Are you going to be better? Are you going to be better? Yeah, I'll try to be way? better. I'll try to be better after that. I'm sorry. I apologize to everyone that's listening and anyone that knows me and my family. So you're heading out to Baton Rouge. Uh, mm-hmm. Might be fitting to get some sort of I don't know Cajun food in your life. Did you know this is ironically enough works out perfectly? It's serendipitous almost. So Zaxby's has a Cajun spiced blackened chicken club sandwich, and that same Cajun spiced blackened chicken can be thrown into one of your Zaxby's uh, salads. Your your what do they call it? Salads. Salads. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. you know I did. I I'll be honest. I'll be a hundred percent honest with you, Aslan. I did not know that, but now that I do, I'm gonna get me one of them sandwiches just to get my taste buds ready for what's about to happen over the next three days in Louisiana. Oh yeah. Got to warm, got to warm up the taste buds a little bit, stretch the legs out a little bit before I go there and eat some of that famous etouffee. Yeah, yeah. If anybody wants to come with me to Zaxby's, you can have the bacon off my club sandwich because I don't eat bacon. So there's that. <laughs> there you go. That's a, what a what an invite. Well, you know, just giving out free bacon doesn't happen all the time. You're true. All right, so uh, it's Renegade Express. It is Thursday. Uh, we'll also have a program for you folks on Friday. We recorded a sit down with Brody Miller from the New Orleans Times Picayune, but he's based out in Baton Rouge as the LSU beat guy and um, got some insight into uh, the matchup that lies ahead. You're going out again to Red State, Corey. Uh, great memories for the Clark brand out in Baton Rouge, right? You, you kind of reveled us with, uh, or regaled us rather, with some of those stories earlier in the week. But. Well, not really great memories. Like I said, it, it was a downpour, so I got drenched. It was an ugly game. Florida State won. It, was a, it wasn't a good LSU team, but Florida State struggled. I think they were down at half by a couple touchdowns, maybe. Uh, it was like 14 to 2. It was a weird score. Uh, came back to win, uh, barely. And then later that night, Kirby Puckett hit a walk off against yeah, my Braves sorry. to force a game seven. So, sorry not, not great, great memories. What's the worst weather condition you've been in as a, as a spectator? So, I would say. I'm trying to think it was either the, I think it was the 86 Florida game might've been the 84 Florida game. I think both of them had crazy downpours, but I remember like just, we were sitting in the stands and it was a flood coming down the aisles. Like literally it looked like a flood. Like it looked like a waterfall coming down the aisles, A, 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 a big one like Niagara falls going all the way down from the top of the stadium, uh, to the field, just a rush of water in every aisle. It poured. And I, afterwards, my dad had to take me and my sister to, I think at that time, Kmart oh, yeah. uh, to get us brand new clothes because ours were in and, and new shoes because our shoes were done. So that was a rough one. That was a rough one. And Florida State lost on a on a phantom holding call. I think for me, it's still it's still 2003 Miami game. That just, that was child's play compared to those Florida I, games in the 80s. That was at that one, too. That was that was just a steady, depressing. Yeah constant rain it was a little cold it wasn't like a flash flood right it was a little cold though too it was a little bit cold mm-hmm. yeah, for yeah. florida standards in october right what's that? understood does does the independence bowl is that top five worst weather conditions for Corey clark at a football game man that was rough but you know at least i was indoors okay and the in the fine folks at the walk-ons bowl treated us well i know i didn't maybe write the nicest things about shreveport but that had nothing to do with the fine folks at the walk-ons bowl. They treated us right. They even gave us samples in the middle of the game. 
coming up and give us giving us like shrimp and grits bites and stuff it's good stuff man not no no uh so but yes it was very very cold luckily i was hardly on the field at all i know it's 90 degrees out there heck it's closer to 100 but you you still should wear your walk-ons bar and bistro pullover from the independence bowl when you're in baton rouge i think that'll give you some cred you know, I might. I actually uh, broke that out the other day. A couple days ago, I wore it uh, just because it was the only thing that was clean that I could find on my floor. So I picked it up, smelled it, smelled clean. I think I just washed it maybe earlier in the week somehow and uh, wore it. Felt good. Felt right. So, yeah, that's back in the rotation, buddy. Uh, I forgot I even had that uh, that shirt. I'm out here looking out for you, man. Appreciate that, dog. Yeah. All right, uh, so Warchant.com. Again, check it out. Use the promo code Warchant30. Lots of good stuff going on over there. I'm sure Corey will keep us abreast of his adventures out in Baton Rouge. Let's get to the Renegade Express. We started off with, I welcome everybody in on the thread on the Tribal Council. Get on there, folks. The family of Martin and company headed to Baton Rouge where all that stands between them and Omaha's two more wins and one of the more rowdy fan bases in the game. Wild. James Blackman's up to 184. Plenty of girth to handle the rigors of the ACC or nah. Will he praise in the offensive line, offensive coaching? Are you buying in yet? Those are the things that we put out there for the fans. FSU underscore one underscore fan says, I just have a comment. I think all of that is great. We'll support regardless of the ups and downs. Go Knowles. Okay. So, All right. Not That's a fair and foul weather fan right there. Yeah. Any kinds of weather, that guy's going to be there uh, supporting the Knowles, our, our woman. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's. I think start. most fans are like that, man. I really do. Don't you? I know he just had a little comment, but don't you think most fans at their heart, like I'm a Braves fan. I'm always going to cheer for the Braves, whether they win 70 games or win 100 games. I think most Florida State fans, they can be upset. They can be frustrated. But the ones that want to fire everyone all the time, fire Martin, fire Taggart, fire Hamilton, man, I, 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 I still think that's the minority. I still think in, in their own way, though, they still root for success for the team. They just don't cope with the failure well. Like, I can be a miserable – Like so I had a friend, my roommate, who played baseball growing up, was actually like an above-average baseball player. He probably should have played club baseball at Florida State instead of just being a bitter, washed-up high school baseball player. But, like, there's nothing he wanted more than to see Florida State baseball go to Omaha and win a College World Series. And, you know, man, we arrived, you know, he arrived at Florida State a year before I did. But talk about guys of my ilk that are 36, 37, 38, around that age. Like, when you got to Florida State, they had been in three national titles in a row in football, like four out of the last five or whatever. And then, what, Omaha, they made it to the championship series or the championship game in 99, made it back out there in 2000, and then... It didn't crater, but it just obviously – you just felt like, all right, I'm a student at Florida State now. We're always going to play for a national title game. We're always going to go to Omaha. And, you know, he was just one of those guys where as soon as they would fall down, he's like, yep, see, man, 11, shook up the lineup again. Why? Why would you change up the lineup? You're 50 games in the season. Why did you do that? But as soon as they would rally and score three runs, like, all right, attaboy, that's what we got to do. Attaboy, Eddie Martinez, esteve. Way to swing the, way to swing the, the right. aluminum, you know? That's just the way he did things. And I'm – I think I, to a certain degree, was that as well. You know, like the Jeff Bowden offense. You would just be like, oh, here we go. Three and out. Look at that. Three and out to start it, start it again. Five, five drives, five three and outs. Way to go, Jeff Bowden. But then as soon as something starts rolling, you're like, yes, all right, good, good. That doesn't make you a good fan. I don't think it necessarily makes you a, a bad person. Maybe you're not a, 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 good, a, a good fan, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to cast as being too negative. We all have our different ways of loving and expressing our, our joy and, and our disdain in our favorite team. True, true. It's also different outlooks on life, man. I've I've always the the Braves in the '90s kind of turned me into a half as the glass is half empty kind of fan and very cynical and very when's the other shoe gonna drop? Right. Um, kind of changed my whole outlook. Before that, I was all like, "Oh, my team's gonna come back and win. They're gonna rally and win. I believe in them." Now I don't believe that ever is is ever gonna happen. <laughs> so it's just mindsets of how you are. But I obviously, I think you know, I I do think there's a small small fraction of a percentage that actually would rather they be right than Florida State win. Like, I think there is a percentage of people on the message boards and in life that would that are so against Willie Taggart right now, and frankly, we're so against Leonard Hamilton and Mike Martin at certain times, these kind of people, that they would rather Florida State lose so they could be proven right. But I think that's a small percentage. Like, I think some people would be 
kind of not all that happy if Willie Taggart went 10 and two this year. Cause then that would mean they were wrong about saying he was a joke of a hire and they're never going to be good under him. But I think those people are allowed, but they're, they're in the minority. They're very, very few of them, I but think- we do see them. And I do think there are people that like, that are like that. They call themselves Florida state fans, but they really just want to be right. And that's more important than the, than if their team wins or loses. But that's nothing exclusive to the Florida state fan base. Sure. Sure, and I didn't mean it like that. Yeah. Those are there are people in life that are like that. I know Braves fans that are like that. There are just people in life that would rather be right than be wrong and get to cheer for a winner. Right. That's all. You know, I, I don't know if I totally agree with that. I think the people that might want Willie gone or think ten and two is is going to make them look wrong. They're going to be mad at themselves for being wrong, and they might throw excuses out there. Oh, well, the schedule's easy or things like that. But I think if you're going to call yourself a fan. You're ultimately happy. I mean, for 10 weeks, you're happy because you just won yeah, but 10 you, games. You've been on the message board long enough to know that ain't always the case. There, Trust me, man. I, I've gotten those Leonard Hamilton arguments for years, and they disappeared. Those people disappeared. And I don't – there's a few of them that I know have kind of come around, but others just don't post anymore. Meanwhile, when Leonard Hamilton was losing, they posted all the time. Right. They don't ever post, man, I love this team. I love Leonard, and I'm I'm not talking about Florida State fans. This isn't every. I'm just using it because this is a Florida State centric show. Wake up! There are people that that they disappear when the team does well. I I get a lot more. Trust me, I will get a lot more tweets about this baseball team and Mike Martin when they lose the next time they lose than I do the last four days. It's just that's that's the nature of fandom. Number one, but there also are people that would again. I we you met them. You know them. You you've interacted with them on message boards. They would rather be right at all costs, even if it means to the detriment of their team. I, I mean, I do believe that, but again, I think that's a very very small percentage, and I think it's a sort a form of psychosis. I think it, those people need help, um, and I, I don't know how they get it, but those people need help listen because they're not the real sports fans. Just listen to the show more. Spread the word. It's exactly therapeutic. Right. It's good. It's good. Uh, John Henry Jones Jr. Congrats on the new sponsor, you guys. I'm heading to our Zaxby's this week for lunch to celebrate. There we go, John Henry. Attaboy. That's my dog right there. Yeah. Yeah, hey, you you can get that Cajun sandwich if you want. Yeah. Cajun Spiced Blackened Chicken Club. Or there you go. That's, the, that's the, uh, the proper name for it. Yeah. Yeah. But if you tell them you want that Cajun sandwich, they'll know what's up. Yep. Keeping things baseball related, Corey, what is your favorite Brave Stadium now that they are on their third stadium since they've been in Atlanta? How does the game atmosphere at the new one compare to the previous two? Keep up the great work, and Aslan, don't you quit for anybody. I made yeah, a bet, though, John right. Henry. I made a bet. You know, I, I got I to gotta be a man of my word. We'll see how it goes. I would say, um, well, this the one they're in now is, is the nicest one they've had. Um, but, yeah, I would, I, you know, but I've only been there a few times, maybe four times. It's just hard to compare, man. I grew up in Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. My best memories are there. They won a World Series there. The Sid Bream sliding in the home, beating the Pirates in Game Seven was there, um, clinching the '91 pennant. All the all the good memories of my late teens and early twenties were in that stadium. And even my childhood, when they were terrible, I still went a lot, and it was still fun uh, to watch Dale Murphy. They were just terrible. Um, so I, you know, I, the the best stadium is the one they're in now. The sky, the view is awesome. Uh, it's, you know, it's just got that feel. It's got that feel of a new stadium with a modern amenities, but also kind of a classic old feel. It's got brick in the outfield. I don't know. Turner Field, I never really liked it. I, I thought they didn't do a great job with that. For some reason, they had this huge, it must have been a 200-foot, when you walk into the stadium in the entrance, there was a 200-foot picture, like a big board, like a big, I don't even know, it's not a billboard. It was just the front of Turner field was this picture of a baseball. They, they used a 200 foot wide. It had to have been 200 feet. It, it, it maybe, maybe it was a hundred feet. It was enormous. It was the biggest picture of a baseball that has ever been. And it was the, I, I, I think it was the baseball that Hank Aaron hit number seven fifteen with, okay. but okay. How, how about just having a picture of Hank Aaron? It literally could be any baseball. It doesn't even say Hank Aaron, 715th. It is just literally a picture of a baseball. So that was really dumb. Uh, a lot of good times in Turner Field, too, but a- the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium is where I had the uh, the best memories. And this place is nicer than both of them, this current place. The launch pad. 
You right. know what it has, this new place that the other places did not. Turner Field was basically built in the middle of nothing. There was nowhere to go. If you wanted to go have a dinner before the game, you couldn't go anywhere near Turner Field. And same thing with Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. They were right next door, essentially. There was no there was no neighborhood built up around it. Certainly not a neighborhood you wanted to go rolling in and uh, go out to dinner. They didn't even have restaurants. They had one bar that you would never walk into in a million years, and that was it. At least this place, it's more like the the places you see in other cities where where they're they have the battery, which is a bunch of restaurants and shops and bars. So they've made that more conducive uh, to the fan, where you can go get dinner, hang out, walk around the streets a little bit, have fun, and then go into the game. Anyway, that was a long answer, but he asked. That's what everybody wants from Hauser, right? Everybody wants to move Hauser to the IM field so that you can walk ten feet instead of ten thousand feet to you know college town and all that kind of stuff but it would be cool what's that what's the place that has the pool recess yeah it would oh, be cool if like man. you built up the yeah. the uh the stadium so it butted up against whatever road that is and occasionally kids would hit home runs into the pool oh yeah that's woodward i think it's woodward woodward right yeah, yeah. and you'd hit and you'd have some unsuspecting 18 year old sunbathing and then they get hit in the gut by a uh, drew mendoza home run let's see what we can do we got some Zaxby's but Zaxby's money to spend. We can see what we can do on that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Let's get, get that going. Feasibility study. Maxwell Gibbs. All right, boys. What the heck was that we witnessed over the weekend in Athens, and where has that team been all season? Well, we kind they of were asked, sandbagging. Yeah, they I kind were of sandbagging. Asked, we kind of asked Eleven that. I mean, Eleven just. Well, I think J.C. Flowers said that they always knew they were capable of doing that, but no one really knows exactly, you know, why it all sort of fell into place. You know, Eleven talked about the. You know, they're a young team, but they've they've grown up. They've learned throughout the ups and downs of the season they've had. Um, I, part of me has to think so much of the, the reason they won was because of obviously their offense. And Mike Martin Jr. is the guy who is, is stirring that drink. I mean, part of me thinks that, I mean, just the urgency of what was ahead of them, you know, squeaking into the region or squeaking into the tournament, going to that regional um I mean, Mike Martin Jr., he's coaching for his own career, and he's coaching for his father's legacy to a certain degree. And I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm being too romantic when it comes to thinking about it, not as pragmatic. But I, I, there had to be some sort of rubber meets the road, buck stops here thing where it's we, we can't, whatever we've been trying to do that hasn't been working, that you guys don't like, all right, screw it, forget it, whatever. Nothing matters anymore. But this is what we have to do. Like look around this look around this clubhouse. This is what we have to do to win baseball games. We have to go up there and we have to be aggressive and we can't swing at nonsense and we can't have a dead out at first base and we can't have a strikeout machine in left field. And and not to be callous to those young men that I know they're trying. No one goes up there trying to strike out. Nobody goes out there trying not to to get on base. But we had just seen too much to, to just to kind of keep that going. There, there had to have been some sort of, I don't know, some some sort of just feeling and urge that, that you had to shake things up and you had to go get it. You couldn't just sit back on your heels anymore. Because, um, listen, we talked about, like, Mike Salvatore has been great the entire season. Reese Albert's been up and down. He's been hurt a little bit. Mendoza's been steady, consistent. Robbie Martin is, has shown some pretty good flashes. Um, but then, like, you get a, a crazy thing like Tim Becker happens. Uh, a little bit of that postseason magic, postseason mojo happens to fall in your favor. I mean, I, I think that's ultimate. It's it's a, a rambling response, but there's just so many things that went into it. But ultimately, I just think it's they went and took it. They they went they went after it and, and seized an opportunity rather than just kind of playing out a string and just hoping things would work out in their favor. Yeah, I mean, they just they played well. They they there were other stretches this year where they played pretty well. Uh, not what they did in Athens, but they had had stretches where they played pretty good baseball. And they just did it at the right time, man. They they pitched pretty darn well. They fielded terrifically, and they hit the ball better than they, you know, considering the competition, they hit the ball better than they had all season. And there's a lot of factors that go into it. Confidence, you know, I talked to a, a Mead about that after the game on Sunday night, and he said so much of it is just confidence, and that's true. That's true in everything, man, in every walk of life. But baseball, even seemingly more than any other sport, it's confidence. If you stand in that batter's box thinking, "Oh man, I need a hit." I have to get a hit. You ain't getting a hit. But if you go into that batter's box thinking, I'm going to knock the tar out of this ball, 
you have a much better chance of doing it. And I just think they went through a funk where everybody was in their own head. Nobody, they, they had no confidence in themselves. They had no confidence in their teammates. Anytime something went wrong, they folded and said, here we go again. They weren't mentally strong, I don't think. And that, that comes with being a young team. And if you want to just break it down to like straight up reality, like you talked about, they got out to – they Carter Smith and Tim Becker gave them legitimate production at the bottom of the order. They're seven, eight, nine hitters, I think combined for like 13 hits in four home runs and six extra base hits in that in that regional. Seven, eight, nine. They got nothing out of their seven, eight, nine all season long. And now all of a sudden you get to seven, eight, nine, and you're like, okay, we can get something started here. The, all season, the seven, eight, nine was not good at all. And you're talking about essentially nine outs a game from those spots, which is three innings. So you're, you cut it down to a six inning game because you know, those guys aren't going to do anything for you. And they didn't. I mean, again, we, we, I don't want to rip on the kid. I'm not trying to rip on the kid, but Cabell has 88 strikeouts. He, I, I think I looked it up where he made 35, 38 outs this year that weren't strikeouts. I mean, number. that's impossible. And, you know, Drew Mendoza has a bunch of strikeouts, too. I think he's up to 65. Well, Drew Mendoza also has, like, 66 walks right. and 16 home runs and 14 doubles, whatever he's done. You were getting all these strikeouts with absolutely no production. And it was just they finally just cut bait and said, you know what, we'll try again next year. We yeah. can't do this anymore. Well, and what, Carter Smith has been a revelation. He was yeah. He was very good. They tried him at times in this season. It just didn't work out. Let me ask you this, Corey, and I don't want to go too much on it because we got some other questions, obviously, to get to, and there's a lot more baseball-related ones. So you, you talk about confidence, and that's valid. But this team really hadn't done anything up until that point to feel too – I mean, I don't know how much of that NC State game really made them feel great. I, I, did the confidence, you think, come more from – just the looseness of, yeah. hey, man, we yep. just barely got in here. Let's go ahead and do whatever. Or what could it, could it really be just like one moment, like a Tim Becker hitting a two-run home run out of nowhere, and then everyone's just like, dude, let's go. Yeah, I, th I, I really do think a lot of it. You, when you can't play baseball when you're tight. And the Georgia's coach talked about that after he lost to Florida State in the first game about how, um, you know, were, were they going to – is it good to be desperate or is it bad to be desperate? when you're playing baseball, he's like, no, you, you know, basically, no, you don't want to play desperate. You don't want to play where you're gripping the bat too tight and you're gripping the ball too hard. Nothing ever good comes out of that. And they weren't, you know, uh, you know, I think it's, I think the answer to your question to both questions is yes. Like the being loose certainly helped. They had been squeezing the bat so tight the last, what, six weeks, eight weeks of the season that it was hard for them to get anything going. They were a tight, nervous group. But when they got into the tournament with nothing to lose and no expectations, all of a sudden they're just you, – you are playing with a different mindset. You you are playing out there almost just, let's go see what happens. Let's go have fun. Let's beat the tar out of this guy. I keep saying beat the tar. I, that's not something that's even in my – We don't do that anymore. I don't say that. I don't ever say that. I don't. I try not to anyway. I really want to say the C word. Well, can we say crap? Yeah. I should say that because the C word can be a few right. different ones. Yeah. Um, so anyway – so I, I do think that helps, just being loose, being loose and being up there, just foot loose and fancy free. But then also seeing what Becker did too. I think both of those contributed to it. And it's like, oh, if, if Tim Becker is going to start hitting bombs, then, then you know, this is good. We're all, we're all doing this. And I, I think that you feed off it. And it is contagious. And they did all start, you know, one through nine, with the exception of maybe Nelson. They all had really good series, really good regionals. That's I, I yeah, but I think mainly it's just being loose. And you're loose. You play better when you put when you're loose, man. In anything really, maybe not football, but everything else. When you're loose and just out there having fun and playing, you're going to almost always play better. And when you play better, you get confidence. There you I, go. Boom. There's my pop psychology. Maxwell Gibbs also asked, "What game should my wife and I fly down for this fall? As much as I want to fly down for the Miami game, I don't want her first FSU game to be one where we could potentially lose. Also, I don't want to take her to a game where there's twenty thousand empty seats. This will be her first time on campus as well, and seeing my old habitat where a lot of shenanigans went down. Well, you Probably. can't you can't have both, Maxwell. You're married no. to her, so she really can't leave you." Um, I mean, it, unless you, you die, I mean, it's till death do us part. So you got that going for you. Right. Uh, two, 
she's Brazilian. I think maybe the Miami game might be a little overwhelming. I'm sure you've sold it to her that Tallahassee is just this awesome, great, rambunctious, over-the-top place. All that said, do the safe thing. Just come for the home opener. Is that is that Monroe or Alabama State, Corey? Man, he said he didn't want 20,000 MPC. But you, can, you can't. I mean, well, this is the thing. Do you want to risk coming later in the season when they're playing NC State and maybe the season doesn't work out well? You know, maybe they lose to Boise, maybe lose to Virginia, and then you got a two-loss team in the middle of October. I mean, it, then it's going to be 20,000 empty seats, and it's going to be kind of depressing. Come to the home opener. Yeah, there's going to be empty seats, but at least there'll be good feelings and good vibes. That's no, I, look, if she's Brazilian, I'm assuming uh, she is either familiar with or has been to many Brazilian soccer matches. They football. take that sport very seriously. The, the other football, yeah. football. They take that very seriously over there, down there. Um, I would say bring her to the FSU Miami game and see how it compares. Oh. Ask her how it compares. I, I would be interested to know what the difference is between a Brazilian soccer match, whether it's a international with the international team or if it's just one of the league teams in Florida State Miami. Yeah. Well, so that's my vote. I mean, Miami. you want to you come and watch Louisville? Come on, man. Come on, Max. Take her to the Miami game. Dude, Miami's game nine. That's November 2nd. So yeah. that's kind of late. It'd um, also be a good time to get out of New York. It's I probably mean, only going to be, you know, low right. 60s in Tallahassee. It'll be 20 degrees in New York. Perfect time to take a little vacation to Tallahassee. Yeah. I mean, it's risk reward. I mean, but then again, I don't know. It is. I mean, if they're rolling along, that Miami game is going to be huge. But, like, do you want to, I don't know, I guess to Corey's point, she's, condition to this possibly i don't know I, i'd be a little bit nervous and again and maxwell's a younger guy so he's probably going to still want to get kind of loose and get after it and start pounding some tequila do you want to be around rowdy miami fans with your wife and maybe have to kind of act out of line in front of but her? there's only there's only gonna be like eight thousand of them there's gonna be seventy thousand rowdy garnet fan garnet gold fans so uh, I you say bring her down for the numbers. opener. Louisiana Monroe, September 7th, 5 p.m. That's crazy. I say Maxwell, don't listen to that. Okay. Miami. You know your instinct. His instinct was Miami, and you need to stay with Miami and come down to the Miami game. Tommy Hawk Chop with Mike Martin retri or retiring rather, and FSU in the market for a new head coach. If Mike Martin Jr. is the front runner, why not hire or make it known that he is the next guy, if only for recruiting reasons? Appears we actually may be looking outside the box. However... Do you think that if we somehow magically make it to Omaha, the Martin legacy continues? This was posted on Monday. I think Corey made a really astute observation in terms of the list that was published on Tuesday of the official kind of head coaching candidates, those who had submitted the paperwork and gone through the proper protocol. I think to Corey's point that he made on the program the other day, that was kind of to demonstrate to the fan base that, hey, this is what we got. These are the groceries. So meat is really appealing. Uh, okay, everybody good with that? And, um, yeah, if, if if they make it to Omaha, absolutely, uh, the, the legacy continues. Even if they go 0-2 in barbecue, I think. to to Actually, I hate saying that because who knows? I mean, you lose and then, then you feel it and then you see it and you touch it and you taste it and you're like, I don't want this anymore. But to turn this team around, keep the 40-win streak alive, take down a national seed, um, yeah, you got to keep it going. Yeah, so I think the the interesting part of that question, I shouldn't say that, it was an all an interesting yeah. question, was if it is going to be Mike Martin Jr., if it does turn out to be what we've all su suspected um, and what makes the most sense really financially and everything else-wise, um, why didn't they just announce it er much earlier than this? Yeah, that is a good then question. That way, yeah, it's a very good question, and it's one that I will ask um, when, if, and when that time comes. Because, you know, it like like I talked about in the last show, like he was out recruiting um, a day after the the regional win over Georgia. He was out recruiting in Atlanta, and what's he telling those kids officially yeah. when they say, "Hey, man, I want to know who I'm going to be playing for." Like he's beating the bushes trying to recruit these kids, and he doesn't even know if he's going to be the. Uh, or maybe he does now, but he didn't 10 days ago when I talked to him, if he's going to be the head coach or not. So, um, and it does, it has, it is a challenge. I mean, it is a challenge to recruit for two or two years. Like they've had to recruit, not knowing who this head coach is going to be. So I've always thought that they should have done. And I know people, you know, roll their eyes when they hear it, 
But if it is Mike Martin Jr., I've always thought that when they announced that this year was going to be Mike Martin's last year, they should have also announced that Mike Martin Jr. was the co head coach in Wade. That way he could also – remember one of the, the great head starts that Jimbo had that other coaches didn't have is he could start implementing things immediately. Yeah. And, and now he didn't get to do it to the extent that he wanted it, and I talked to him about that. It was actually really interesting. One of the times I was talking to Jimbo about – if he could do the head coach and waiting over again, what did they get right? What did they get wrong? And he said, well, what they got wrong was if you're going to make me the head coach, or I guess he used someone, if you're going to make someone the head coach and waiting, then they should also be second in command at that time. Like he goes, we didn't have any, like I didn't, I wasn't anyone's boss. And I, I, so I didn't get to, I didn't get to really call any shots. I was just an assistant coach that was treated the same as any other assistant coach. But it was the which OC. Didn't, I mean, come on! You're second in command as the OC, Jimbo. No, Suck but you're up. not. You're not. You don't get to run. You don't get to run the recruiting. You don't get to decide who you recruit, who you don't. You 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 have to listen to Chuck Amato as much as Chuck Amato hey, has to listen to hey, you. Hey, hey, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go, Mickey Andrews. You're not his boss. Dexter Cart. None of those people really listened. To, like Jimbo wasn't their boss. He was just an assistant coach to them. He was another guy. He wasn't. There was no like peer. There was no ladder a leadership ladder or a pyramid they were you know it was bobby bowden and everyone was underneath them about the same uh so so that's what he said he would have done different is give the guy more responsibility and more accountability as the head coach and waiting to get him prepared better for the head coaching spot and let him start implementing things that he wants to and he wants in his program let him start going ahead and doing that he didn't get to do that Mike Martin Jr. maybe could have already started doing some of those things if he was the head coach for waiting, but in fact, reaching out to other coaches, getting them on board. But more than anything, recruiting. That's the bottom line. Well, like it's been, it hasn't been the easiest thing in the world. Now, Florida State has a lot of built in advantages. We get it when it comes to recruiting. But one of the things they haven't been able to tell kids with complete, utter, sincere honesty is, yeah, I'm going to be your head coach because they don't know that. Well, let me ask you this, and then we'll move along because, man, we're at 30 minutes and we have some more questions from Tommy Hawk okay, and sorry. some of the other folks. What is more valuable, though, to, to give meet that head start to recruit or to create this environment around his assertion or his uh, ascension to the head coaching job that it was an actual process? Like, how many people would have, especially when this team got, I mean, imagine if he was named the, the head coach in waiting back in January, and then this team gets shut, or, you know, lose the Jacksonville in a doubleheader and then gets no hit by Stetson. I mean, who, who's to say that that would have happened, I guess, if he was the head coach in waiting? But I guess my point is, what's more valuable, getting a nice head start or giving him an environment that's going to let the fan base, his sort of, you know, the flock, if you will, make them at least feel that that this university vetted and and did their best to to put somebody there. And ultimately, they decided that Meat was the best guy rather than, we don't even have to do this. It's just such a slam dunk, no-brainer. Let's just keep this thing rolling. I, what had to have happened, in my opinion, is so the season ended last year in June. Right. So you had from June to January – to figure out who your next head coach was going to be. You knew that Mike Martin's last year, I don't remember when it was announced officially, but you know you knew that 2019 was going to be his last year. So why not do all that, all that vetting, all that interviewing, all those applications? And I get why because it was an interim AD. It was it was I I get there was there was there was some uh they were in flux in the athletic department. They had just lost Stan Wilcox. I mean, I get all that. But um but that would have been the way I would have handled it if I had if I had any control was, hey, from whatever, August to December, that's when we're going to decide. Especially if it's meat. And, but, you know, and then I but I get the other side, too. Like, OK, so say you decide you're going to hire uh, uh, Kevin O'Sullivan. Well, w w so when so he just coaches, he's a lame duck coach at Florida. For the 2019 season, he quits and joins Florida State as an assistant. Like, I get that, too. I get why it's, they were just in a weird spot. And I know I was criticizing maybe the way they did it four minutes ago, but now that I talk it out, I don't know what you could have done. It's a weird yeah. spot. Yeah. But I don't think I, – I think there would have been some people that took umbrage if he was just named, hey, Mike Martin's – we're announcing that this is Mike Martin's last year. Also, when his career is over, Mike Martin Jr. will be the head coach. There would have been 
plenty of fans absolutely. that would have been like, absolutely, they would have been like, uh, hey, wait, what? Yeah. You didn't even you didn't even have a search. But I mean, also, guess what, man? Again, I keep coming back to it. it, it they would have gotten over it. It's college baseball. At the end of the day, there are people that are still going to say that. Like if Mike Martin gets named the head coach in a week, Mike Martin Jr. gets named the head coach in the week, there will be plenty of Florida State fans, probably maybe rightly, that said he was going to be the head coach all along. So all that was just a smokescreen. I don't know if that's true. I don't necessarily believe that that's true. In fact, I know that's not true. But there will be people that think that anyway. So... You can't win if you give if you're giving the job to Mike Martin Jr. People are going to think it would spin in the cards for two decades anyway. So you could have just said in January, "Hey, by the way, Meat's going to be our head coach." But I get why they didn't. It was really it's a hard deal, man. It's a really weird situation. The, the legend is retiring. His son is on staff, has been on staff for 20 years, and really wants the job. But it's a great job, and there will be plenty of people that are interested. It's a it's a it was a tough deal. There's no guarantee that Mike Martin Jr. is going to be a great head coach. He's never done it before. Uh, there's also no guarantee that you hired anyone else. They would have come in and done a good job. It's a tough spot. Tough spot. Tommy Hawk Chop also continues with, after listening to the interview with Lonnie Alameda the other day, or the other week rather, I think we should consider her for athletic director. Seems to really understand culture and is a natural speaker. Fundraising might be the area she lacks expertise, but she makes me want to donate to softball. Uh, lastly, he gives me a nice note saying that I catch a lot of BS. Keep slinging it, brother. Enjoy your insight, even though you like Jimbo. Best podcast team out there. Five stars every week. There we go. Thank you, Tommy. There we Hawks. go. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, Lonnie Alameda. I could, I could, I could go for that. I could go for that. Her being the AD, she would create a, a culture of of connectivity, connectiveness. I feel like Lonnie that would want to be one of be one of the few things that Lonnie would want to do. Certainly right now. I think she you do you get the sense that she does not like her job? No, oh, no, no, no. I think way. Lonnie loves her job. Yeah, yeah. Loves it and wants to do it for as long as she can. Being an AD is a whole different set of hassles. She gets to just love and recruit and play awesome college softball. Yeah. But, yeah, I think she'd be good at it. I'm not saying she wouldn't. I just think she loves her job, and, and that would be a big hassle. Did Ray Tanner, was he doing double duty when they won the national title at South? No, he got it afterwards, right? I don't think, yeah. I think he moved from yeah. baseball coach to AD. That's I think great. so. But, yeah, back in the 70s and 80s, like, I'm pretty sure Vince Dooley was the AD when he was also the head football coach at Georgia. Right. And I think Pat Dye might have been the AD. Or somebody. In, there were other SEC, like Frank Broyles. I, I feel like – um. I don't know if it was a way to pay them more money back then. Like sometimes they'll do that, or they used to do that in high schools where the head football coach to keep them, they'd also make them the AD. So he'd, he'd get that extra bump in pay. That's what they do in high school. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I maybe they did that back in college in the 70s. But, man, I feel like growing up, half the coaches that we watched were also the AD. Yeah, Crazy just that just shows you how much more is on the plate these days because there's absolutely no way you could uh, could kind of really double dip into both those spheres and do a good job of I mean imagine Jimbo like somebody coming to Jimbo in 2012 and being like hey what are we gonna do about this beach volleyball team (laughs) and Jimbo would be like you better get out of my effing office right now (laughs) I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out this bubble screen (laughs) honey fried pickens good morning Noel Nation by the way I mean we got to keep the show wake up war chain even though we don't broadcast live well we never the show never was live i think maybe for like a few weeks not when i've been here yes anyhow good morning to you honey fried pickens congrats to the baseball team and on the zaxby sponsorship guys love me some zaxby sauce as do i <laughs> thanks for reading my question aslan how many wins do you feel like fsu needs for recruiting to really take off or should there be more of an emphasis placed on how the team looks would a scenario where the team wins seven or eight games are competitive, organized, and appear to have fun provide enough appeal for recruiting to shine? Thanks for giving me some off-season entertainment, gentlemen. Well, you know, I asked Michael Langston this question. I, I peeked and saw this, and I asked him when we were driving out to Madison, or Greenville, I guess, rather, to hang out with Travis J. And kind of was asking him, like, you know, how many wins would they need to get this thing really going to, to maybe kind of start landing some five stars? 
and it it would be a, a sort of delayed reaction it, unless they're involved with a kid right now and he's been on campus would 10 wins seal the the deal sort of I, I, 10 wins isn't going to make some kid that hasn't considered Florida State up until this point I, I don't think that's enough to swing them at least that's kind of th- that was Michael's words and I, I tend to agree with that plus I, th- I don't know in this day and age like does 10 wins really wow a kid I mean you know going to the playoff winning your conference title winning the national championship like that's the kind of one year swing I think that could you know, make kids really start listening to your pitch. Uh, but I guess maybe more nitty gritty to the point that Honey Fried Pickens asked, will it, is there wins or is it the aesthetic of the way the team looks that will help the, the recruiting? Uh, I would lean more towards the aesthetic. Like if it looks good, if they, you don't want to lose games, but it's probably maybe a little bit easier to pitch losing 42 to 35 than it is 24 to three. Um, but I mean, there there's, listen, I mean, if it's seven wins, that's a two-win improvement, but I, I don't know how much of a cloud is lifted off this team if you're one that believes in the, the negative vibe around this program is what created a, a subpar recruiting class in, in 2019. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't – I think nine and ten wins would help this year, um, a, a, you know, a sizable amount, but it would be the next year's class, right? Right. And, and, I, and I, to the question, yeah, I mean, wins matter. Um, you can't you can't be one of the worst offenses in the country. You just can't and and recruit at a high level. The kids don't want to go play for an offense that scores twenty three points a game and completes fourteen passes. They just don't want to do that. So if you can prove that that's not the case, then you're going to get an uptick just automatically on that. They want to go play for a fun team and a fun offense. The winning though does matter, but I, I yeah I don't think that like they're not in on many five stars right now. I don't think like some five star wide receiver that hasn't thought of Florida State at all, all of a sudden if they're five and one in October, we'll be like, you know what? It's time. I'm going to Tallahassee. I don't I think they're too late in the game on right. these guys already. Yeah. It's the class after them that I think can be get a really big uptick if they start uh winning. And, yeah, looking good doing it. It'll be really interesting to revisit the nineteen and maybe to some degree the twenty class because there's there's been a shift in what they're going after. And you can talk about character guys, guys that, that are about FSU guys that want to help turn this thing around. But they swung for the fences coming out the gate in, for 19. You know, I mean, 18, they had to piece it together last minute and did about as good as you could hope. But, you know, they, they talked about it's, it's, it's fun to walk into a, to a high school and have the Seminole Head logo on your chest. Although it would be better if you had the, the 2012, 2013, 1989 Seminole head logo on your chest, but they went after guys. I mean, we talked, I was talking about with Michael on the trip that that Saturday night live event they had at the stadium, which wasn't at night, by the way, and was a sweltering freaking sweat box, man. They had cave on Thibodeau was in town. He's a five-star Tyler Davis was a really great defensive tackle. They had the five-star Cardell Thomas from uh, LSU. They had George Pickens, the five-star from Hoover, Alabama. Uh, they had Nicobe Dean, the five-star linebacker from Mississippi. Yeah. I mean, they literally so had like, if- yeah, I mean, well, if, I'm saying they had they had really good guys, and man, they they whiffed on all of them. And you can say that you know now they're t- telling kids don't commit unless you want to really be here. Take your visits before you do that, and people think that's fostering this sort of great energy. I just man, they've had to change who they're go- they got to get they had to get kids. They they've got to get kids on campus enrolled and and to roll it. So I feel to a certain degree that may, this that's not, these maybe aren't the caliber of guys they wanted. But they've they've plotted out a different direction. We'll see how it works out over the, the, the next two, three years. Well, I do think those kids they had on campus, the big time kids, if Florida State starts the season six and oh, right. or five and one and is exciting and high flying, man, you 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 probably land a couple of those. They they can buy in. Like Willie Taggart is 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 uh really personable with these kids. They they like him a lot. I mean, think about that kid would was apparently seriously considering coming all the way across the country to play for uh, for Flo- uh, a team that had gone seven and six the year before. That's Came how much Willie Tiger can sell it. Right. Um, but you know, when you look like you looked, that's uh, again, and you're being, and these guys are being recruited by the best in the country. Man, it is hard to say yes to a team that is now twelve and thirteen in its last twenty five games and was one of the worst offenses in the country last year. You don't, we can't blame these kids. 
right. for not wanting to play for this program right now, no matter how great a recruiter Willie Taggart is and how much they kind of want to go play for him. You also have to think about yourself, and is it fun to play in, on five and seven teams? No. You don't want to lose your whole. You don't want to lose your whole college career. Um, so yeah, that that it all it all works together. I think again, I've said it all along. When he starts winning, if he starts winning, they're going to start coming. All of them, not all of them. Obviously, you're not going to have 150 signees a year, but you're going to get uh, a ton of great players if you start winning. But can you start winning until you get the great players? It's the chicken or the egg, Aslan. You know how it is. No dad, eighty four, gentlemen, wake up. I mean, there's a whole bunch of A's and K's and E's in the wake. I don't really know how to pronounce it. There's been some great discussion on the Tribal Council. Use the promo code WARCHAIN30 if you're not a member. Check it all out. About Florida State not joining the SEC back in the day. I haven't seen this thread. I haven't seen this thread. I know you previously talked about this last year, but was wondering if your positions have changed. Do you feel FSU was scared to join the SEC when looking to align itself with a conference? Secondly, if given the chance, would you leave the ACC today? I'll plead the fifth on that since I'm going to probably try at some point to get a job with the ACC network. If so, what conference would you want us to join? And if a second school had to go, whom would you bring with us? As usual, good work. Go Knowles and F Miami. Always F Miami. So you wouldn't want to bring Miami with you to the SEC? Probably not. I guess, I mean, everyone's going to say Clemson. I don't know. I I don't remember, and I'm not well read on FSU leaving or was it they weren't in the Metro for football? Were they in the football or were they independent? They were independent. No, they were independent. Yeah, Yeah, they were independent. I'm not well read on the, the entire wooing and courtship between the conferences and Florida State. Scared. I think, I think Bobby said a comment in the recent past about something about not wanting to play in the SEC, maybe being scared, but that's just Bobby being folksy and, and I think maybe getting taken out of context. Um, I don't know, Corey. I think you you might have a better formed opinion on it. Yeah, so if my recollection is correct, I know people have said that, uh, that Florida didn't want them to join the SEC, and I don't know if that's true or not, but, but Florida's just one vote. And Florida in 1989 or 90 – didn't have the cachet to tell the SEC what to do. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like Alabama now, Nick Saban could be like, no, you're not adding Florida State. Get out of here. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, miss, okay, okay, Mr. Saban. Right. But I think back then, Florida didn't have the uh, the cachet to tell the SEC to do anything. So even if Florida didn't want them in, I don't necessarily think that's why they they weren't in the SEC. I think what happened was they were the they were the big dog, like them and Penn State. I think were the two most attractive independents in the night in the late eighties. They were both independents. They both needed maybe Miami too, I guess. Um, and, and they needed a conference, but Florida state and Penn state even much more than Miami because of the fan bases And you know, Bobby Bowden can say, cause I think it was something like, yeah, we wouldn't have won as many national championships or I didn't want to play these teams every year, man. LSU was garbage. The entire nineties yes. was garbage in Florida state beat them in 90. We just talked about how they beat them in 91 and they would have beat them in 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, all the way through the nineties. LSU was nothing, nothing. You, you, you know, Florida treated the sec almost exactly like Florida state treated the ACC. So there's this, there's this misconception that the sec in the nineties was so what was what it was in the, in the two thousands. Once Saban got there, it ain't man. It wasn't Florida rolled through the nineties in the SEC, beat the tar out of Georgia. I did it again, beat the tar out of Georgia every year. Florida State in the 90s would have been, maybe they don't, no, man, I, I'm not even going to say that. If Florida State had been in the SEC in the 90s, they'd have won the, they would have been, they still won 10 wins at 10 games every year. Miss me with all that, man. It, it, the, the SEC wasn't any good. Georgia had Ray Goff coaching there, and then Jim Donnan. Florida had Spurrier. They were awesome. Tennessee had Fulmer. They got it going. Nobody else was worth a darn. You tell me Mississippi, Florida State's going to be scared of Mississippi State or Ole Miss or Alabama with whoever was coaching them. They had you know three good years under Stallings, and there were nothing. Come on, man. Mikes. They had a bunch of Mikes. Mike DeBose. Yeah, exactly. And none of them could coach. Florida State would have rolled through the SEC just like they did the ACC. But Frank, just look at the numbers, man. Florida State played the SEC. They beat Auburn every time they played them. Auburn, 
Auburn had a home and home at Florida State and canceled it because they didn't want to play Florida State and lose to Florida State. Man, they wouldn't. They weren't scared of Auburn. They would have beat the bejesus out of Auburn too. They, you know, Spurrier was awesome at Florida in the nineties, right? Yeah, like he was. That that's they he, that's he turned that program around. They dominated the SEC. I think Bowden went seven three and two against them in the decade, and Spurrier never won in Tallahassee. That was the best SEC, the best the SEC had to offer by a wide margin. And Florida State still beat them almost every year. So Florida State yeah, beat they, their best team ever. Florida State went into the swamp and beat them. Yeah, Florida State. All did that, they to. of course. Like the Florida State wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have. It wouldn't have hurt Florida State at all. Now looking so, but I think what happened, if I remember, my dad used to tell me this, is that Florida State always wanted to get in the SEC back in the seventies. Like always wanted to get in the SEC, and the SEC always said no. Of course not. We're not taking you. Why would we take you? you what do you? You don't win. Like this was early seventies, mid seventies when Florida State wasn't what it became under Bowden. So the SEC always said no, no, we don't want you. And then all of a sudden, when Florida State becomes what it became, the SEC is like, oh yeah, well, yeah, you want to come? You want to come join it? I, I this is what I remember being told. And then the ACC comes, makes them, I guess, as good to offer. I think at that time you got more money in the ACC than you did the SEC because I think the revenue split that was more 50-50 with basketball than it is now where it's like 95-5 football. So at the time, the ACC made more sense financially, I believe. And also, you know, I think they were kind of like a screw you to the SEC because the SEC kept saying no to them all those years. And then all of a sudden, when Florida State became the best program in the country or one of the top three programs in the country, all of a sudden, now the SEC wants you. Well, no, we don't We don't need to do that. And to your we point, beat you every year anyway. And- now, in hindsight, and I know this has been a long, long answer. In hindsight, we can say now that we know what the landscape of college athletics is. That was a mistake. You know, I, I mean, if they had a choice but to do it all over again, between the SEC and the ACC. Now, I just laid out that I don't think it would have cost them any, really any significant drop in football success in the 90s. But also think of all the money they'd be making now. Yeah. So, but they had no way to know that college, that, that was 30 years ago. Nobody could have foreseen this happening. What was the internet? Nobody. There's no internet. There's no Twitter. How could they have no known? No Twitter. Yeah. No Twitter. I didn't know who, who would have thought in 1989. I would be in a car or I'd be walking down a sidewalk and be able to watch a game yeah. on my phone. On a phone? What? I would have been like, wait, what do you what? mean? Where's the where's the phone connected to? Is it a power pole? Yeah. No, no, it's just in your pocket. Yeah, but what's it connect? No, no, you don't worry about it. It's wireless. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. We, nobody could have foreseen this coming, 1989. Um, so yeah, man, there's a it's a it's a very complex, complicated uh I guess history of why that did or did not happen. Um, and obviously, I think if they go back in time, they would take you know the 20 extra million or 18 million extra dollars they're beginning every year now. But at the time, I think they, you know, they, they the ACC made more sense. And I also think they would leave for the SEC in a heartbeat. Frosty Jacks. The worries over Blackman's weight are silly, Corey. Well, he didn't p- pick you out, but I just added that because I oh, agree. Okay, he got destroyed by defensive lineman all 2017 at 170 pounds and never got injured. He's going to be at about 190 by the start of the season and tougher than ever. I don't know about that. I mean, he's 184, I think, to think that he's going to gain six pounds in the next 90 days. Oh, who cares? Nobody cares. I, I mean, if he gains six pounds or not, he's always going to be skinny. Yeah. Yeah. If he gets, if somebody hits him in the knee, ha, doing all this extra uh, weight work, being bigger, his knee can still shatter. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I, But he is a tough kid. We've said that. And he did survive all of 2017 with not a great offensive line. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that 12 pounds is going to make a difference and make him bionic. Right. It's just, you know, you'd rather him be bigger than skinnier. But also, at the end of the day, you hope he stays healthy. Also, I think when we forget about this, and I wonder how much of, of injuries, and I don't think people talk about enough, you know, we're created to maybe fill out at a certain weight. I mean, you want to talk about walking around at 350 for some kids, if that's natural or good. I, mean, I guess that's a, a, an episode for another day. But, like, you know, like maybe James Blackman's, like, ligaments are not meant for him to walk around at 215 pounds. I know that sounds crazy because he's 6'6 or whatever, or 6'4. But, I mean, you want him to gain all this weight. There could be, you know, sort of, 
collateral damage that comes with that. Man, he, he moves around fine. Not, his game isn't running the ball all that well. And, and I don't know how much more. 15 pounds might do more harm to him than good. And I know that sounds crazy to a lot of you, but it's 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 possible. And I, I don't think that's that's not any top 10 concern of mine when it comes to James Blackman is his weight and durability concerns. And I don't know, getting blindside is going to, having five more pounds of, of weight and another 2% body fat, how that's going to help you out. He needs to figure out what he did in the second half of the games that he played in the first half of the season and figure out what he did so well against Florida and Monroe and Southern Miss, those entire games. I mean, maybe he kind of did hit his stride. Because um, he, he plays with such, like, for me, the concern with James Blackman, again, He's not going to be a guy that's going to complete 13 passes in a row in a game. He's going to spray the ball around sometimes, I feel like, the, the closer intermediate stuff. I just feel like, not to say he can't grow out from it, but from what we've seen, I think that'll be the drawback on him. But can he just emotionally be grounded for 60 full minutes? Because he, he plays with energy. He, he's such a leader. He wants to get everybody on the same page, and he wants to lead the team to a win. Not that other quarterback so but he just has a way of showing it if he can just stay calm if they can get him just relaxed work him into a groove early into games I think that's the biggest sort of bridge he needs across to be successful I don't, I don't think it's a, a physical weight thing it's more between the years I wouldn't mind him gaining that six extra pounds though that's hey have idea. you ever seen Field of Dreams no never seen it you haven't you know the you know the the story though the guy's a farmer is Dad passes away. He builds a baseball team. His dad comes back with his friends and plays baseball. Spoiler. Um, sort of. His dad had been dead a long time before he bought the farm. But he he uh, he takes like some of his crop. He, he, I guess he grows corn. And in the middle of a cor- his cornfield, he builds a baseball field. Okay. And then all, the whole the whole plot is that he he took so much of his corn away that he's going to be foreclosed upon. He can't. He has to sell. Now, otherwise, he's going to be foreclosed upon, and he can't um, he can't pay it. He can't afford it. He's going to lose the farm and lose the house and obviously lose the field. That's the whole drama of the movie. And I guess I was going to ask you, but you wouldn't know. Like, is a baseball field really enough of a – like a baseball-sized chunk of your farm with yeah. corn? Would that be enough for you to go from a productive um, – in the black, harvest? Yeah, to now I have to sell my farm in one summer? Where did this come from? We weren't even talking. Do you think he should eat? Oh, corn? it's on the t- It's on the TV as I, I, right now. As I'm, wa- I was watching it on TV on Sundance. Noel Rick, did anyone ever see Eleven and Jimbo actually have a conversation together with Martin's slow, measured cadence versus Jimbo's used car salesman talk? It is like they are speaking two different languages. I'm sure they did. I- I know they, yeah, I know he, Jimbo would be in the dugout some, and Jimbo is a huge baseball fan, so I'm sure, oh, they definitely had conversations, but no, I don't think I ever saw one live, because that's true. Like, Eleven will talk, and you're not sure when he's done sometimes, because he really does take a while to formulate some thoughts, even in the middle of a thought of it, itself. Yeah. And and so that'll happen every, you know, once every couple press conferences, he'll still be talking, but one of the reporters won't know it, and we'll start to ask a question, and then he starts talking again to answer the question he was still answering. And he'll wind so, up Yeah, sometimes. I can't imagine those two guys talking to each other. And he'll wind up sometimes, and you, you think he's about to go into a long answer, and he'll just give you four words, and you're you're like, is that okay? All right, yeah. okay, next, yeah. So, yeah, he, he keeps you on your toes. But he's, he's so much easier to transcribe. It's like they speak – it is like they speak a different language. Like, you could you don't know the horror – well, you would never would anyway, really, but the horror of trying to transcribe a Jimbo Fisher. And I think that's interview. why there's so much heat. I think that's why there's so much beef between you guys and Jimbo. You guys all hated transcribing him. If he didn't speak Crazy. like that's what that's what it was. That's what it was. Like, it was that's, impossible. That's why Willie Willie's all like slower and and more deliberate because he's like, man, I don't want to get on these guys' bad side. <laughs> they ran out a guy who won a national title here because he spoke too fast. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's what it was. Also for Corey, was it painful watching your dogs get pummeled last weekend? Not at all. Um, you know, I can't say that I was a hundred percent excited about going to Baton Rouge, although I, it seems like it'll be a cool experience. Only because uh, you know Brady's only got a couple tournaments left. I wanted to watch one of his last ones, but it, it turns out it's probably going to get rained out this weekend anyway. So no, I was not rooting for Georgia in the least. Um, uh, you know, the, the, not at all. And I and I it wouldn't even be the 
the, it wouldn't be that it, it'd be the same thing in football. But mainly, you know, I know Mike Martin and I know Mike Martin Jr. So I root for them more than I would root for uh, for my alma mater in a in a in college baseball. Plus, it's a better story, right? Yeah, who like cares eleven riding this thing out as long as he can. That's that's what I'm rooting for. Is the better story? Just, can you imagine all the just him on the podium after winning? I mean, you talked about the dog pile the other day. Him jump, full head start, last guy on the pile jumps, twists, lands on his back, hands, legs sprawled out. The 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 everlasting image from the 2019 College World Series. Him just you know they're going to give him 59 minutes of whatever he wants to say on, on live satellite television beaming out of Omaha after the, the game. It, it it's I can't think of, I mean, what would Florida State have to do football-wise to match the, the goose-bump-inducing just chill of awesomeness if he were to win it all? Like, I mean, Florida State would have to... I don't, like just yeah, they could. Would you trash Florida like like sixty five to zero in the championship game? But you would already play them earlier in the year. Like, would you? I, I can't think of like what would you? What could you do football wise that would just make it um just like a miracle? Even if you did the choke and doke, like they're down thirty five to three in the national title game, and they come back or thir- what thirty one to three? Sorry, thirty one to three. Sorry, everybody. I thought yeah. I said thirty five three. And then they come. Even if they did that, it still wouldn't be. I don't think. I would probably cry. I, 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 I'd say I'd cry if Mike Martin wins. I don't, I don't think I'll cry if Florida State wins a, a football national title the rest of my life. If they win in Omaha this year, Mike Martin's last year, I'll probably cry. I want to cry. Make me cry, Mike Martin. Make Man, I'll be cry. in the dog pile if they win it this year. I'm, yeah. I'm going to run down from the press box and jump in there with them. Yeah, no, I mean, I, there's no way that football could ever match something like that, only in the sense that they've already accomplished everything. They've already done it. Anybody that's a Florida State fan, a big time Florida State fan, has felt what it's like to win a college champion, a uh, college national championship in football. They felt it. This would be different because of who it is. The fortieth year, it's last year. But again, I feel like we're getting uh, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. I oh, think they should be. dogpile. I guess they would, right? You dogpile if you go to Omaha. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's what the dog pile is like. Getting in the getting into Omaha is how it, like I think it originated. So maybe there. they should. Maybe that's when Martin should do his when Eleven should do his whole run up and. No, he's gonna win it all, man. All I'm right. trying to okay. think. Okay, hey, I'm 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 hoping. I'm I'm right there with you, hoping for it. What if two sports star Brady Clark leads Florida State to the national title game, and his father is in the hospital with like. A life-threatening condition, and I don't then, like the way that turned. But then Brady Clark throws a game-winning touchdown. His father snaps out of it and returns to full health. And there's a live shot of him pumping his fist in his hospital bed with a tear running down his face as his son hoists the trophy in the air and the confetti falls on him. I just, that'd be, that'd I be feel, goosebumps. I, I don't feel like we had to throw the hospital part into the equation. Couldn't I just been in the stands cheering on my kid? Oh, it doesn't tug at the heartstrings as much. Are in the press box writing about them. You're going to pull out of it. It's going to be fine. You're going to live to be 97. I don't want to be in life, you know, any life threatening condition in my, in my, where would I be? I'd be 50. Well, I don't want to be in a life threatening condition it, when I'm it, 50. It turns out it was just bad gas. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yes. So then I look like a big baby. Okay. We're going to root for 11. It's happening. And also, I don't cry. I can't cry tears. It's not a I, little. I can't. Yeah. You don't. I mean, the way you talk about everything in life, I can't imagine you getting, uh, I can't see it happening. No, I mean, I literally, I cry. I've cried. Uh, uh, Brady's made me. Brady made me cry yesterday. He's being such a little brat. No, I'm just kidding. But I can't. Like, I, I literally, tears won't come out of my eyes. I can't. I've never cried a tear. Like where a tears run down my face. What? Never happened. No, I don't have them. Well, don't, your eyes just turn really. Your eyes just turn really red. Yeah, they get watery, and I cry, and I make the I make the ugly cry face. It's happened. My dad. I cried at my dad's funeral. I cried at my buddy's funeral. That happens. But no tears. They even get watery, but no tears ever released from my eyes. That's that's fascinating. Yeah, much like the Field of Dreams conversation. There we go. Wow. I'm sorry. We that made me cry, too. Way. Field of Dreams made me cry, but not tears. <laughs> I ruined everything. I hope you guys all have a great day. He's Corey Maslow. We'll talk to you all on Friday. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. 
Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.